Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first talk of the series uh, Talk Materialities, a series of lectures uh, that I am curating for the BSR Fine Arts Programme. The intention behind Talk Materialities is to explore the wide panorama of contemporary approaches to art and materiality through the work of artists, curators, and art historians. It is a great pleasure and honor to introduce the speaker of tonight's lecture, Amber Doe. Amber is an artist who lives and works in Tucson, Arizona. She was in residence at the BSR last summer as uh, the recipient of the Abbey Fellowship in painting. Material as metaphor lies at the foundation of Amber's artistic practice. As the artist states, her work springs from ancestral connection and environment, natural and societal. As a descendant of American slavery, she looks at Black experience through subjects and material. Um, before starting the lecture, I just want to remind that this lecture is being recorded. Um, and please send any questions or reflections to the Q&A box um, that you see uh, on the screen. Uh, and now um, over to you, Amber. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today, Marta. It's such a pleasure. Um, thank you to the British School at Rome and to all of you attending this lecture today. I am so honored and grateful that you would spend your time, precious time with me. Let me bring up my screen, if you don't mind. As an artist, I have plenty of visuals to go with. All right. And we're ready to talk materialities and material as metaphor. With our shared time today, I'm going to talk materialities and contextualize the meaning of material as metaphor as it relates to my work, specifically my self-portrait, superhero cape, working with what's left, Monticello, and Ho for Shame, SS, all of history is in my body. Let me begin by talking a little bit about what being an artist means. I'm gonna open with a quote from black feminist giant, Hortense Spillers. Her essay is called Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar book. Let's face it, I am a marked woman, but not everybody knows my name. Peaches, brown sugar, sapphire, and earth mother, auntie, granny, God's holy fool, a Miss Ebony first, or, Black woman at the podium. I describe a locus of confounded identities, a meeting ground of investments and privations in the national treasury of rhetorical wealth. My country needs me. If I were not here, I would have to be invented." End quote. Art has always been a way for me to make sense of the world, starting with my earliest and most fundamental memories, my mother and my maternal grandmother. My mom always sketched and painted when she wasn't working. She learned traditional Native American beadwork and how to weave dream catchers when we lived on a Southern United States Native American reservation. However, my understanding of art shifted when my mom told me I was going on my first solo trip with my father to Paris, Lomé and Accra. In fact, the inaugural image in this presentation is my passport photo from my first international trip. I was scared, but my dad, pictured here with me, should have been the scared one. He had never been around children in such a way, and I provided him a full experience. My mother's way of calming my fears about this trip was to tell me he loved art too. What a relief, he was just like us. In retrospect, my upbringing was surrounded by art, I just didn't realize it. My mom was an artist, my grandfather was a singer, and my grandmother was exceptionally stylish, and now my dad. 
I was definitely a child living in what I would describe as simultaneous realities. On one hand, I lived on an impoverished reservation. And on the other, my first museum experiences were the Louvre and the Musée de Orsay. I was very young, but I remember my mom and grandfather telling me to pay attention. I was doing things and going places they could only dream of. So I was responsible in the retelling. They wanted to live through me. These words and their intention shaped my entire life. Naturally, I saw a lot of art, but the art that stayed with me was from the Musée d'Orsay. It was Manet's Olympia. A stark, white, pale, nude female juxtaposed with a dark female presenting flowers and a tiny black kitten. I can close my eyes right now and go back to my seven-year-old brain making sense of what was in front of me. The flowers were beautiful and definitely not for the black figure holding them. They were for the naked white figure at rest. Instinctively, I knew I was supposed to think that the figure in the foreground was beautiful. She deserves flowers. She is supposed to be the center of attention. She is the center of the image. Therefore, she is the center of the world, this world. As I grew up, matured, became more familiar with the brutalities of being a black female living in the world, living in the words of bell hooks, quote, the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, end quote. I finally became curious about the black figure in the background. She wore gorgeous earrings, so that was an immediate connection. And she was clearly portraying a domestic. Over 207 years later, so was my own beloved grandmother. So as I looked at her, I thought, what about her life, her name, her dreams, her aspirations, and her want for flowers and rest? Why isn't she allowed to occupy and take up precious space in the world? These are questions that I'm still actively interrogating in my own work. In this image is everything you need to understand my work. This is my grandmother, Aja Henrietta Chase, born April 18th, 1925. She is holding my mother, Iris Louise Chase, born August 30th, 1958. Standing next to them is my uncle, Clarence Chase Jr., born January 22nd, 1953. And most likely the photographer is Clarence Chase, born October 25th. I never remember the year because he lied about the year he was born so he could serve his country in World War II. All of my work is born from this ancestral connection. I included this image of my family and other figurative representations to speak to the material abstraction work that we will explore as this lecture continues, because they are the reasons I am an artist. Their importance, despite attempts of erasure and invisibility, I carry a deep responsibility to shed light on underrepresented members of society and hidden histories. Returning back to Manet's Olympia, I want you all to know that the model's name is Lor. Lor is the name of the black model. It is my job to know her name so I can tell it through my work. Lor was one of the recently freed black people after the French abolished slavery in their colonies in 1848. The reason why knowing Lor's name and story is important is the same reason why the picture of my mom and grandmom are important. Their collective importance is summed up beautifully in Audre Lorde's poem, A Litany for Survival. Here is an excerpt. When we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. Continuing this narrative are the words spoken by Malcolm X in Los Angeles, California in May, 1962. Quote, the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. The Spillers quote, Lord's poem and Malcolm's words are an apt reference point to start discussing material as metaphor. My work is intended to speak for black women and black girls, not just my family, but an entire community from ancestral to the present. 
there are limits to figurative representations. I prefer the dark space of symbolism and abstraction. There is unlimited power in that space. So my use of material as metaphor is a demand for tenderness against a dominant, never-ending brutality. The blackness I am illuminating with my work deserves poetry, material abstraction, and sensuousness. When the figurative realities of my subject are grotesque, it is necessary to not re-traumatize myself in the retelling. Self-portrait, superhero cape, and the Monticello installation are the examples of material as metaphor I will discuss with this particular lecture, but I could easily discuss any of the work you will find in my portfolio using the same language. This picture is my mom and I at the reservation. Self-portrait rope skirt. I'm gonna to switch to this image because I should note that self-portrait is currently being exhibited at the Urban Institute of Contemporary Art in Grand Rapids, Michigan in their Manufactured Narratives exhibition. It will be there until May 7th. Go and see it in person if you can or tell a friend in the area to go see it. This picture was actually provided by one of the other fellow artists in the show, Patrick Wilson. So this is what self-portrait looks like at this very moment. And I'll go back to this version of self-portrait. It is named self-portrait, but it is a portrait for the entire black American community. It is composed of metal hoops and unraveled organic cotton rope. It is not a static piece of work. It is a living organism. It has changed considerably since I first made it. It changes with every move. It has been moved around a lot and the structure tends to look different every time. You can sort of see it even with this first image and you move to the second one. I think it looks completely different, which I love. It's a picture of me with my self-portrait also looks different. Self-portrait comes from a space of anxiety. The weathering hypothesis I have endured my whole life. Weathering hypothesis is a term created by Dr. Arline Geronimus based on her research finding black women suffer from early health deterioration based on cumulative exposure to social, economic and political inequities. I would add to that the research from Georgetown Law Center on poverty about the quote, adultification of black girls, end quote. In the landmark study, they determined that with regularity, white adults believe, quote, black girls are less innocent and more adult and deserving of harsher punitive punishment, end quote. In short, black girls deserve no protection. Self-portrait is a reflection of art and its connections to the natural world. The ancient caves around the world where hu human art has been observed is often images of animals. Early humans learned about life by watching the animals in their environment. I enjoy a similar elemental approach to my own practice. The initial inspiration for self-portrait came from the spider. How fortunate a creature that it is capable of creating a home wherever it goes. It can spin an organic substance from its core and create a space to eat and rest. What does that space look like for my muses and myself? For the majority of my life, my mom's main American dream preoccupation was home ownership, something that has been exhaustively researched and detailed from innumerable sources as something systematically out of reach for black Americans through the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. So I created a home. Self-portrait is my home, it is our home, it can be your home. The materials used serve as a complete portrait for innumerable others. Cotton rope was used to lynch my ancestors. It was a cash crop produced for material wealth by my ancestors in St. Helena's Island, South Carolina. My enslaved ancestors were not considered human, but a cash crop and an object for material gain in the exact same definition as cotton, indigo, and tobacco. That cotton was spun from a collective web through my hands to serve as home. A home reminder of the past and present as a space of reclamation and unquestioned personhood. 
Self-portrait is named for my ancestral recall, but it contains multitudes of stories and selves. It could just as easily be named Nancy for Nancy Hemings, an enslaved master weaver at Thomas Jefferson's opus, Monticello. Thomas Jefferson, architect of the Declaration of Independence, noted Federalist, enslaved over 600 people over the course of his life, men, women, and children. Who can think of the American dream without thinking of Thomas Jefferson and all of his eloquence about the American right to owning property? Our very constitution is based on his persuasive arguments. Property and ownership are the cornerstones of American democracy. Self-portrait acts as a way of reframing the American narrative, shifting the focus to where it rightfully belongs, the wealth of the nation built by invisible blackness, invisible black women. This is my reproduction piece for piece of Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, where Nancy Hemings, who I'm about to discuss, lived and spent her entire life working. Nancy Hemings was born in 1761 and was trained as a weaver. Herself and her two children were given away as wedding presents from Jefferson to his sister. In 1795, Jefferson started a weaving business on the grounds of Monticello to further supplement his vast wealth. So he repurchases Nancy, but not her children. For over 30 years, Nancy faithfully passes on her weaving knowledge to fellow Jefferson slaves, mostly children. Jefferson's wealth increases and her own grandchildren are eventually given as gifts to Jefferson's grandchildren. At the time of Jefferson's death, Nancy is deemed worthless at his estate sale, worthless despite working her entire life to create wealth for others. For this reason, self-portrait is as much hers as mine. Nancy's valuable life is woven into the very material fabric. Self-portrait and the Monticello installation were created in tandem. An enslaved master builder and slaves built Jefferson's home and popular tourist destination Monticello. My Monticello takes over where self-portrait left off, continuing with the material as metaphor use of my labor as a, as a descendant of slavery and continual cash crop along with my sister crops of cotton and tobacco, both grown by enslaved people at Monticello. The installation goes further in its storytelling with the employment of postcards, a popular purchase to keep as a souvenir from a visit or to send to loved ones to discuss your visit, to tell someone you love them or thinking of them and how you were passing the time and to acknowledge that you have visited an important place. Please note the images I am about to show are graphic and sensitive. They are actual reproductions of postcards from the 1880s that were sent and kept as souvenirs throughout the United States. The United States Postal Service banned distribution through US mail in 1908. A larger collection of the images you are about to see can be found in the book Without Sanctuary, Lynching Photography in America, by James Allen, John Lewis, Leon F. Litwack, and Hilton Alls. Viewer discretion is advised. Including these postcards in the Monticello installation was essential. In this image here, I digitally lynched myself in one of the postcards. I have a close up of the lynching here. This lynching of myself was based on two lynching stories. A woman called Laura Nelson, who was lynched in May 1911 in Okame, Oklahoma. It's Laura Nelson's body that my face is on. A mob sees Nelson and her 14-year-old son, accusing them of food theft. Laura was then raped by several men before being lynched. The bodies of Laura and her son were hung from a bridge for hundreds to witness. The second woman, Mary Turner, was part of a larger group of lynchings, collectively known as the May 1918 lynchings. They killed Mary's husband first, 
She was pregnant at the time of her lynching. She was strung by her feet, doused with gasoline and oil and set on fire. Next, her unborn child was cut from her belly and stomped to death. Mary was repeatedly shot and no one was ever brought to justice. This is a statue done by Medeva Warwick Fuller in her honor. Actually, Medeva Warwick Fuller is a Philadelphia sculptor that I discussed as a part of my Abbey Awards Fellowship application. My grandmother's maiden name is in fact Warwick. The Monticello installation was conducted within a protective circle of trees. Monticello is at the base and surrounded by lynching postcards nailed to trees. These images slash postcards are important to the community that they existed in. They were sent to cousins. They were sent to family members to report on the activities of that summer and to check in and say, hi, love you, miss you. We lynched someone this week. These are all images of actual postcards that surround this installation of Monticello. My installation reclaimed the space and narrative for community work, ancestral and environmental healing. For Nancy, Laura, Mary, and countless others, my hands in conjunction with the earth in the material form of cotton and tobacco and paper, the materials used carry the story of the subjects. The companion piece to self-portrait in Monticello is superhero cape. It is made from the same organic cotton rope, but specifically for black girls that are not permitted to be children and not recognized as innocent. To protect myself, Iris, Aja, and honor all of us. The protection comes from the shape and the magic attributed to capes it is the material of our ancestors labor. So their protection is sewn into the threads. In this image is self portrait, superhero cape and working with what's left. This is from an exhibition curated by Misha McGlown entitled Women's Work in New York, New York at the Leroy Neiman Art Center. Working with what's left, which is this was commissioned by curator, curator Dayon Huff for an exhibition entitled A Patchwork Story. The materials are fabric scraps, wires, beads, string, found and discarded items. A Patchwork Story was designed to honor the long revered artistic tradition of quilt making within the African-American community. Each individual artist was asked to provide a modern interpretation. African-American quilts have an exalted history as a storytelling medium and a place of freedom and expression. One of the most famous contemporary artists and narrative cult makers is Faith Ringgold. She was originally a painter and made a point of saying that she switched her medium to quilts to distance herself from Western slash European comparison and tradition. No one was willing to publish her memoirs or autobiography. So she started telling her stories via quilts. This quilt is called Tar Beach Two. It depicts Ringgold's memory of growing up in Harlem. Rooftops are gathering and celebrating in the summer. It is best observed in a quilt like hers, the African-American tradition of lush, full of color, detail, there's a story structure. It's just really beautiful. I think she's a prime example of African-American quilt making tradition. As you can see, however, my quilt is incredibly spare. When I got the commission, I wanted to tell a truthful story about where I was at the time. There was and still remains to be a sense of intense lack. I was not in a better financial or romantic position than my forefathers and mothers. This quilt is a reflection of ongoing sacrifices made year after year by family members from the past into the present, representing a real regression, increasing scarcity of financial opportunity, marriage, family life, and contentment from one generation to the next. 
instead of adding more pieces year after year and making the story and quilt richer, warmer, it appears more and more is being taken away from the contemporary African-American family. This is what a quilt looks like when people have fewer resources to pass on to the next generation. Working with what's left brings a quilt, family quilt down to its core, to the symbols that started the tradition in the first place. These materials are discarded objects from various family members' homes. Before I conclude, I wanna speak briefly about the continuation of materialist metaphor in recent work, including work created and exhibited at the British School at Rome. At the BSR, I created a group of sales. I envisioned with the magic of plant materials, synthetic materials, animal materials, a vessel of creation to transport blackness safely across salt water to a space of liberation. My sales are love letters to Sarah Barton, Sarah Bartman, known as the hot and top Venus. This sale here is pictured specifically for her. It's called Susahora Sale because her actual name in the Khoi Khoi language was Susahora and it was changed to Sarah. So this sale is for her. This sale right here, I wanted to honor Anarka, Lucy and Betsy, the enslaved women on the left that were used and maimed for the development of modern gynecology. This was for my estranged sister, Gina, whose daughter I'm currently raising. This piece is mostly for myself and I'm happy to get into it further um, in the question and answer portion. This one is for my mother specifically, it's entitled Iris Louise Chase. And all of these pieces I would say as a collective are um, for the women that I've previously mentioned specifically, but in general, a collective for black women in the space. Because my work is collective storytelling, and for that reason, the storytelling is not limited to human experience. There is a larger ecosystem of integrated experiences with the natural world and fellow mammals. Carrying intergenerational trauma and using natural and plant allies to integrate, transmute, and alchemize in creating the various sales for Black liberation, at times I felt like a botanical healer. Specifically, the piece entitled Ho for Shame SS, all of history is in my body. This piece is multi-layered in the fact that it is accompanied by my latest iteration of materialist metaphor, sound. Throughout this lecture, I've made reference to the natural materials I use to speak in my work. In Rome, I was fortunate enough to utilize sound due to the masterful work in collaboration with sound artist and musician, Noah Goldberg. I highly recommend you find him on iTunes. Our collaboration was based on revisiting my consistent artistic partner, Nature's Solution. An angel spirit named Vadi recommended Undrowned by Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums. In the world we now live exists a pandemic known as COVID-19, something that has disproportionately affected black women and closer to home affects the center of my world, my mother. I needed a new material ally and started learning about marine mammals as a guide and a means to understand ways of being together as a family, as a larger community, a world community in a time of extinction. I am proud of learning from my marine mammal kin and expanding material as metaphor with a new material, sound. Sound as healing. The most salient material as metaphor in my contemporary work is the fact that I am a Tia slash mom. What that means is that I am my niece Ruby's primary parent. I didn't expect to become a parent in this way, but Ruby is not interested in my soul searching or confusion about being a parent. She just wants her Tia slash mommy all of the time. So far, a lot of my parenting has felt like trying to mitigate loss and to keep her safe. Both of her biological parents are gone. My stepfather, her grandfather is gone. And my co-parent, my mom, almost lost her life in 2019. I was all, already holding an ocean of grief when COVID descended. This is where my marine mammal kin stepped in to teach me how to keep our pod together in a time of devastation and collapse. 
When my mom was in the womb and after she was born, my grandfather sang to her. My mom sang to me in the womb and leaves me singing voicemails to this very day. When Ruby came to me at four months old, I sang to her and we still sing together every single day. When dolphins and whales are pregnant, the rest of the pod quiets down so the moms can sing their babies' names and so their babies will know the sound of their kin songs and voices. I flew over the Atlantic Ocean to make these sails, a quest for a new safe space. I knew the Atlantic Ocean had to be a material. I thought about the gray whale and how they had been missing from the Atlantic Ocean since the transatlantic slave trade. Marine biologists were content to call it a mystery. So many slave lives had fallen into the same ocean. Did these mammal kin disappear together in solidarity, in shared pain and grief? In 2013, 205 years after the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, a gray whale appeared in the Atlantic off the coast of Namibia. Honoring that whale's return with gratitude is star day 87, the, companion, the sound companion to my sails. I will play a snippet for you now. So I just wanted to play a little excerpt for you all. You can find the full recording of Star Day 87 on my website. Thank you so much for your time and attention. This concludes my lecture. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, uh, it was an incredible lecture. Uh, we are speechless here. Um, so um, at this point, uh, um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions and then, uh, you know, uh, see if other people uh, uh, want to interact to you know to to interact with us but i am already seeing it um the first question is uh, um if you can talk about the experience of discussing uh, such complex and painful material in italy where audiences are less familiar with with this context um, were their reactions different to those uh, in America? It's a great question. Um, I think that you would expect based on the subject matter being so American um, that it would that it would be something that people already know about to a greater extent here. But I have found that, um, discussing these things in Italy versus discussing them in the United States aren't incredibly dissimilar. A lot of people that I've come across are, are not familiar with a lot of the historical references that I'm making. So it's, in a way it feels um, refreshing to talk about it in Italy because there's a genuine curiosity and there's enough of a distance from it for them to not feel so personal. I think when you discuss it in America and people hear these things for the first time, they're sort of like, well, that can't be true. I mean, because we do as much as we can to sort of rewrite our history all the time in this country. So I think in some ways it's, it's certainly less traumatizing to talk about it in Italy than it is in the US because there's something that's even more hurtful as an artist when you're in your home country and 
there's no understanding of what you're talking about and it's our shared history. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Amber. Um, so uh, there are a few um, comments and questions also. Uh, can you hear me, Amber? Because you are, um, you are freeze. Mm. Amber? Oh, did I freeze? I'm sorry. Yeah. Internet. Can you okay? Yes. Can you hear? Okay. Back. Okay. Um, so our director uh, Abigail Brundin uh, is uh, here with us, uh, and she uh, asks. Uh, thank, she say she says thank you so much. Uh, that was fascinating and very uh, provoking, thought provoking. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the work for yourself that was on display at the BSR, which you showed us briefly on a slide? Yes, I would be happy to talk about that work. Um, that, that sale was really uh, challenging for me. And I think the reason why I say it's mostly for myself is that um, I tend to be really hard on myself. I think most people are hard on themselves. And um, I was so tired of the narrative about Black women always having to be tough, always having to be strong, always having to rely on these certain narratives and stories. And so I really wanted that sale to be so delicate and to be really pretty. And all these things that you're not permitted to sort of embody as a black woman in the United States all the time. Um, and especially when I think about that, I'm constantly trying to speak for black. Mm. Um, um, Amber, pretty quickly, do racism, anything like that. Amber, sorry, sorry if I interrupt you, but the, con the connection is not good, and I don't know if it's our connection or your connection. Can you um, hear me and see me? Um, uh okay maybe i can uh, oh no is the internet yeah yeah maybe uh i can see if uh, it's our connection and maybe i can stop um my video for a sec while you're talking mm -hmm. so we can hear you okay sure okay. thank you of course okay can you hear me I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Go, go, go ahead. Um, uh, oh, okay. So should I finish? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. That question. Okay. I don't know how much you guys heard of that question being answered, but my best way to describe it is that sale is um, a gift to myself so that I don't have to only be one thing or just one dimensional within this thought process of what black women represent in my home country, which is always this narrative of strength and of toughness and of hardness. I wanted to create something really pretty and really soft and just because and give myself that gift and give the rest of the sales that gift. It's almost like adding honey to something because you want it to be sweeter. I wanted to have some of the sales to have a sense of sweetness. And I, that one very much was for me to feel like I deserve sweetness too. Just sort of talking to myself in a loving way. Um, maybe it was even for Laura's behalf when I think about it. Uh, the black model represented in Manet's, you know, painting. I'm thinking about her too. Doesn't she deserve flowers? Doesn't she deserve softness? And so that's pretty much where that sale comes from. And it's very delicate. So the materials used in that were really hard to work with, um, super fragile. I couldn't even bring it back to the US with me, so. Thank you, Amber. Um, sorry, okay. Um, so uh, we have another question uh, from Ruben Grima, who is our one of our uh, fellow 
currently. Um, thank you so much for this. I was especially impressed by the way you stripped away the neoclassical elegance that Jefferson was so proud of at Monticello to reveal the hidden and almost forgotten lives and skill and labor that made this wealth possible. Could you tell us about, uh, um, uh, could you tell us uh, more about its making? Yes. Um, well, Thomas Jefferson, as I spoke about, was a noted Federalist. Um, there was a group of papers that were all sort of formed together, known collectively as the Federalist Papers. And Jefferson, James Madison, um, John Jay, all sort of in support of moving the United States from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. And these men were all Southern um, and wanted to have this Southern agrarian ethic. But Jefferson is noted in his intense love for European lifestyle architecture. He spent a great deal of time in France, but specifically with Monticello, he was completely basing it on his time in Italy and his deep admiration for Italian architect architecture. And thinking about what grandness should exist and how it should be represented in the United States and was a huge um, user and abuser of slave labor as a result of it. Um, the White House was also built by slaves by an enslaved master builder, same as Monticello. Um, and so he, is someone it seems like in life did not have any issue with that concept, with taking sort of these kind of high refined classical notions and ideas and implementing them in this new world setting and just sort of erasing the fact that there was something really problematic about using people as if they were the same thing as cotton or tobacco. Um, yeah, Monticello is a super layered piece, especially because of those postcards that are um, displayed with it and sort of sit beside it um, to talk about what was happening at the exact same time these things were happening. You're building this like incredible Italian architectural masterpiece using free labor. So. Thank you, Amber. Um, okay, so Eleni Odysseus uh, writes, it is always such an honor to hear you speak about your work. Thank you for sharing your process with us. If we have some extra time and we have it, I'd love to hear more about the piece you created at the BSR for your mother, as well as the one for yourself. Thank you again. And ciao Eleni. Uh, also Eleni was, uh, um, uh, an, uh, is an alumni of the BSR. She was the recipient of the Abbey Fellowship uh, in painting as well. Thank you for that question, Eleni. I love it. Um, so the sale for my mom, the materials within that sale for me, it was really important to look like hair. So I did actually use fake hair. Um, a big part of my thought process about her as a kid, because we all sort of have things that we latch on about our parents. And my thing with her was that she had amazing hair and it was such a statement and such a massive part of her representation of self. So I wanted the texture of that sale to feel um, like it had that hair texture. And then I tried to use aspects of hair in all of the sales because when I think of like tenderness and sweetness, I think of women braiding each other's hair, girls braiding each other's hair and having this very tactile loving experience. So each of these sales, I wanted that experience to come through. Ironically, the only sale that it doesn't come through is my personal sale. Um, but every other sale is sort of built off of that concept of that tenderness that's being literally woven into it. So her sale hopefully feels really dense in terms of like having that black texture and that black hair um, feeling. And I think the reason it was on my mind specifically when we were in Rome and why it was important to do a sale just for her is because she had almost died a couple of months previous to that. And then the levels of medication that she was on to sort of come back from that made you know her precious hair thinner and made sort of 
it had this sense of like, wow, she's really starting to feel the ramifications of working her entire life of sort of having this very specific life of service. And just like her and my grandfather wanted, you know, everything to come through me in the retelling of all these experiences of going to Europe, they didn't get to enjoy the same thing. Still to this day, my mother has never been to Europe. So it's a way to connect her to these spaces that she's heard about, she's interested in, but hasn't been able to physically experience yet. I have a lot of hope that she will in fact make it to Cyprus and Italy someday. Uh, thank you, Amber. So another question by an alumni of the BSR, <laughs> Yelena Stoikovic, who we know very well. Um, thank you for a great lecture, Amber. I wonder if you could talk more on the relations between weaving, storytelling and materiality in your work as a process that develops over time. How much of your everyday experience translates to your work in this process? How do you work in your studio space and on everyday basis? Excellent question. Thank you, Yelena. Um, I think that a lot of my weaving process does feel organic and like my like myself. <laughs> um, I love to, as anybody who did visit my studio when I was in the BSR, I love to create looms wherever I am. I don't take it as an excuse that I don't have a physical loom to bring from place to place. I can create a loom on the wall. I can create a loom with sticks. I feel very, very connected to the fact that the actual hand process is important. And you're well aware of this, Marta, Yelena, and Eleni all know this. There is a material within my works at the BSR that were from a sheep. And the sheep, was an incredibly, ended up being an incredibly important part of all of the works because I had to hand clean it. And the best part of that experience was creating connection with others outside of our immediate academic slash artist circle. I had countless conversations with the staff at the BSR and my super broken Italian and they felt very, very close to the process of what I was doing, of cleaning this wool, of you know, taking it from the most disgusting place it was to this really beautiful thing. And they all sort of talked to me about memories that they had of doing that exact same work with their grandmother or their sisters. So it felt like it really universalized my work in this way I didn't expect and was so much more powerful than I could have hoped for. Because in the moment, I think everyone who encountered me could attest that I was complaining about the actual process of cleaning because it's so dirty, but there's something so symbolic about having to go through that level of literal dirty work to create something and create multiple pieces from it. And then to have it become so beautiful. I mean, the actual, it's, I mean, it's oily, it's dense, it's, you know, it smells like the earth, this. And so I felt like I was trying to say sweet things the whole time I was cleaning it. I was like, sister sheep, we are in this together. I'm doing everything in my power for you to feel honored in your death. Like I really was trying to like even extend the materialist metaphor as far as I possibly could, because I was like, you've given your life, not for my work, but I still want you to feel honored in the retelling. You're going to show up in a positive way. So I think that that's how my weaving and storytelling actually come together all the time because materials are the core to my practice more than anything else. The conceptual part of it is one thing, but I have to have the materials speak the different layers to the story. Yeah, I remember uh, that wool very well <laughs> and I feel responsible also because I brought it to you. Uh, okay, so um, Alessia Zinari, she is a scholar um, at the BSR currently. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Amber. It was such a rich lecture and your work is so powerful. You were talking just now about vulnerab vulnerability and I couldn't help but thinking that you take on so much 
through your practice, dealing with, so, with such traumatic topics and working through and with the body and materiality. I wondered if you ever feel the need to protect yourself from re-traumatization and what strategies you put in place to do so. Do you feel the need to alternate more graphic representations such as your piece with the, uh, with the postcards, uh, with more abstract ones in order to bring in that tenderness and gentleness that you were mentioning? What a great question. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that is a rich, dense question. Yes, thank you. Um, when I got to the BSR and COVID was, you know, it's still here. So COVID was a part of the experience of landing there. And I thought I was going to have all this time to sit and reflect about um, what I was going to do seriously with um, my projects there a friend that I spoke to on the phone said, really think about not re-traumatizing yourself because you do continuously work and tell really traumatizing stories. So make sure that there's space there for you. And I think even coming up with the concept of sales was my way to create that softness. Because if you go into the deep, dark, horrifying stories of the women's stories that I'm telling, I feel like the way that I protect myself in the retelling is, cre is creating something different from that narrative, creating that sale for the hot and top Venus was important. I mean, because if you think about her story, you wonder to yourself aloud, did she ever experience love? Did anybody ever hold her with true affection? She lost her parents super early. She was kidnapped, taking, taken away from her home lived abroad and lived as like a zoo animal for her entire life. That's traumatizing. Hearing about that is a visceral experience. So with this particular project at the BSR, I was filled with so much creative energy there, which I really have to um, say everybody there was really inspiring to be around academics, the other artists. Um, it gave me the space and the freedom to think I could make work differently without traumatizing myself because of the heaviness of these stories. So for her sale, it was all softness for me. I, I, I weaved silver hair into her sale because silver is connected to the moon and the moon was so important to the Koi Koi people remains to be. And so I, and I wanted it braided. So she'd know it's my tenderness coming through. She deserves love. I, you know what I mean? So I think that it's approach that I think started at the BSR that I will continue on with in future work, figuring out ways to tell these heavy stories that are important to tell without re-traumatizing myself in the retelling. I think that's why I like soft materials. I love cotton. I love plants and flowers and those sort of things that I think are so effective. The sounds of the dolphins and that um, sound piece. I think it's so necessary. All of these memories, including myself and the women around me deserve tenderness in the retelling of their stories. Thank you, Amber. Uh, Helen McGrath, uh, what is next for your work and what support do you need from the international arts community and international patronage? Fantastic question, Helen McGrath. I cannot thank you enough. Um, that's lovely to say what's next. Um, I, in a literal what's next way, I mean, obviously I have the show that's at the Urban Institute of Contemporary Art until May. I'm super excited about that. Although it's hard for me to be away from self-portrait, I am excited <laughs> that it's, uh, being exhibited. I just finished recording a podcast um talking about how specifically the desert environment has impacted my work i would say the way that artists and i can speak for myself but i'm sure i'm speaking for a lot of artists i think artists need um people to be reminded that we don't all exist under the help of institutional support so in the ways that you can actually financially support artists is always welcome finding ways to support them by buying their work or in your case marta the ring, the jewelry um, that comes from my work. I think that bringing visibility, if something really moves you, share it. I mean, that is sort of the purpose 
as someone who had their Instagram um, hacked and taken away, I feel that loss of community of years of building relationships with people that disappeared overnight and I can't share my art practice with them. So I'd say realistically, I'd say artists, you know, because I'm a parent, I need like, you know, tangible help. And the thing that's important to me, I'd say with my work is because I feel like I'm telling the stories of others, I would like it to reach as other, as many people as possible. It doesn't feel like it's so insular and so specific. I would like these stories to reach, you know, larger audiences. So anything that supports that, I would greatly appreciate. Uh, Amber, you're a star. We have so many questions. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, Francesca Palmieri, she's a curator um, at La Galleria Nazionale. Um, you met uh, Francesca uh -huh. uh, Thank you so much for the great lecture and for letting us closer to your amazingly poetic work. I have a question or rather a, um, a curiosity uh, from a music composer friend of mine who is following the talk with me. Only if we have time, yes, we have time, Francesca. He asks um, if in your research you have ever come across the figure of Florence Price, African-American composer and pian pianist, whose importance uh, um, has only been recently recognized. Thank you so much and a big hug, Francesca. Thank you, Francesca. A big hug right back to you. No, I haven't. So any information about her and her artistic tradition would be greatly appreciated because I'd say the part of my practice that I'm the least educated on would probably be the history in terms of music and sound as art. Um, it was so fun to do it as a part of this project because I feel so strongly um, about marine mammals in particular and sort of how they align so closely with sort of how humans organize themselves. Um, so any, no, I would love to know more about that pianist and sort of her journey. There's so many countless forgotten um, African-American artists, I'm sure within the tradition um, that we don't know about in the United States. So yes, please pass on any information that you have. And the full length of that piece is available on my website. So you can hear it from beginning to end. Okay, perfect. Uh, Francesca, I'm sure that she will be in touch. Um, Tony Mosley, uh, thank you for sharing your work um, and really appreciate all the insight you have given us. Could you talk about the material in, in you used in the final piece you shared that you made for, uh, that you made for you? It was the, um, the one on a frame with some, with some soft color. Yes, I'm so happy that people are so curious about that one. Thank you, Tony. It's the one I've probably felt the most insecure making, probably because it had to do with me. And um, the funny thing about being an artist is that part of your job is to talk about yourself. And it's like my least favorite thing to do. I think my friends would attest. I always want to hear about what they're doing. I don't want to talk about myself. Um, but the materials there, I happen to love. Um, it has part of the lovingly cleaned sheep's wool that I received from Martha. It has um, oat flowers. It has um, flax, the plant that linen um, is coming from. I wanted it to have flowers and pieces that went back to and spoke to the history of weaving. I felt like that was an important element um, symbolically for that particular sale. So using the actual physical plants um, that I actually saw growing around in Rome, which is crazy too. I randomly saw almost all of the materials I purchased just out in the world, which was fantastic. I wanted it to have, because I put it on a frame, I wanted it to have the context of a loom and have the context of the female tradition of weed because I had that in my head when I'm thinking about Nancy Hemings, her journey, having her children be sold off, being told she's worthless, but that she provided all of this knowledge that we now take for granted in terms of weaving. Um, so once again, I wanted the natural connection in there. 
And then I added the colors to it that you see that are bright within that frame because I was connecting once again to the larger story of the marine mammal connection, thinking about coral and the brightness of colors you can experience in nature and having that translate to that sail, having something that comes from under you know, the water in the world to rise above the water in the world and to get me to and across safely to another world. So that's why there's bright colors contained within that piece. And that's also something I agonized about because I was like, hmm, if you want something to be completely natural, is it fair to have an artificial component? But the truth is there are magical colors that appear in nature, but we can't pretend like we're not existing in a contemporary world of artifice problemat to a problematic degree. So does that piece really reflect what's underneath or is this like something that's speaking to a larger impending climate <laughs> disaster that we're facing in terms of having all this kind of toxicity and the kind of colors that that could produce. And that piece is paired with um, a piece I call Black Woman's Coral, which is my hand cast um, with shells mixed into it to sort of show the Black Woman's Coral is that we, we are here, we're in that ocean. If you cross the Atlantic, you're gonna cross bodies that were lost to the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so to have those two things juxtaposed in the same room, in the same space, um, those are the reason for those materials, I would say. Thank you, Amber. And one last question. I'm sorry if I'm not reading uh, all the questions and messages, but we are really running out of time. Um, um, if you want to continue the discussion with Amber, I think you can uh, email her. Um, yeah. yes. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so last question, Sue Volikas, uh, yeah. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, correctly the surname. You talk often about your grandmother and your mother and what they, uh, what they mean to you. Uh, what, uh, what are you hoping to pass along to your niece through your art? Uh, what do you want your legacy to look like for her to experience and remember? Oh my gosh, that question makes me want to cry. Thank you, Sue Velikas. Um, wow, that is emotional. <laughs> what do I want to pass on to her? Um, I don't want her to grow up with the same limitations that I felt that I had. Um, I had some early traumatizing racially based experiences in my early life that sort of have shaped, you know, or formulated how I believe things should go for a person like me or what I was capable of or what I deserved. So I'm hoping that Ruby will feel proud that she has a parent who created art as opposed to became a doctor or a lawyer, <clears throat> which are the things that make more sense and, you know, material wealth within society is important. And so all of these things, I want her to feel like um, that I haven't let her down by deciding that I have to have a career and a life that looks like this versus something that's more standard. So, and hopefully she will not feel any of the same limitations that I felt when I was a kid. Amber, thank you so much uh, for this inspiring talk uh amazing i was looking forward to it and i'm so glad we made it <laughs> uh, finally um so um thank you thank you to the audience um so many people uh, connected and uh listened to to you amber tonight so thank you for, for being with us. And um, yeah, uh, so if you, if you want to contact Amber, go and have a look to, their, to her website uh, and um, to her incredible artworks. Um, so uh, bye and have a good <laughs> evening. And you, Amber, have a lovely day. Because thank you. Uh, 10 a.m., 11 a.m.
Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. And Ciao. 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 Ciao.